so welcome everyone to the 11th session of the ecofit Al algorithmic colloquium uh, it's my great pleasure to have carl bringman today so carl has done a lot of fantastic work on fine grain algorithms and complexity and you know, substring algorithms and so on and he has also won various prizes for his work including the eatcs uh, dissertation prize and the pressburger award and uh, other couple of prizes uh, so today he'll give us a survey on fine-grained complexity of uh, optimization problems, and I'm looking forward to it. So, Carl, please take it away. Hi, yeah, thanks for for the introduction, Nikhil. So I will be talking about fine-grained complexity of optimization problems. Optimization problems here means discrete optimization, so problems like subset sum, knapsack, and generalizations thereof. And by fine-grained complexity, I mean that we try to prove lower bounds and improved algorithms that match, that to get the right exponent and the running time. And that's what we are striving for. So let's start with the most classic optimization, discrete optimization problem, at least, um, subset sum problem, <clears throat> where we are given a set x of n positive integers and a target number t. And we want to know whether some subset of x sums to this target t. So for example, if our target is 19 and the set of numbers is 2, 5, 6, 11, 15, then yes, there exists a subset that sums to this target. Now, subset sum is the most fundamental NP-hard problem at the intersection of theoretical computer science, uh, optimization, and, um, and um, uh, operations research. That's how I formulate it usually. Um, it's certainly um, yeah, one of the oldest uh, discrete optimization problems, and it draws much of its importance from being a special case of many other problems. So if you think of knapsack or integer programming or scheduling problems, they almost always have subset sum as a special case. Uh, it also comes up in post-quantum crypto um, as a, another motivation to study this problem. Now, throughout the talk, I will use this formulation of the problem here um, for the most part of it. In particular, for simplicity, I'm assuming that X is really a set. Um, typically, you would want to generalize this to being a multiset. You can have uh, multiple copies of one item. Um, but here, we'll assume that it's a set, really. Almost everything that I'm talking about generalizes to multisets. But this just allows me, for example, to always bound uh, that N is at most T in when I write down running times. All right, uh, the, maybe the most classic algorithm for subset sum, I guess next to meet in the middle, is this uh, pseudo-polynomial time algorithm by Bellman, which, um, well, which is often used to teach dynamic programming in undergrad courses, right? So we, we should all know this algorithm. Um, it builds this large table of size n times t. What does this table store? At entry i, comma s, we store whether some subset of the first i items sums to s. And then, of course, we can solve the subsum problem by just checking the last entry, the entry at n, comma t. And we can fill the table efficiently because we can, I mean, we can fill each table entry in constant time uh, using this simple rule here, right? Because um, a subset of the first i items summing to s, either this does not include the ith item, it means that already among the first i minus one items we can sum to s. Um, or um, we do use the ith item. That means that among the first i minus one items, we can sum to s minus xi. And those are the only two cases that we have to consider. So we can fill this, uh, this table efficiently. All right, so we can solve it in n times t time, the subset sum problem. Um, of course, we can ask whether this running time is optimal. Um, this has been asked um, for a long time. Um, so let's start with the dependence on this target number t. Can this be improved? Can it be improved to log t or poly log t? Or maybe slightly less ambitious, can we improve it to square root t? Um, and here we will see that conditional lower bounds rule out such a proof. What do I mean by conditional lower bounds? Well, in general, a conditional lower bound you get by starting from, the, from a hypothesis about the complexity of some core problem. And you combine this with uh, reductions to other problems. And then you, this way, you get conditional lower bounds for these other problems. Let me make this very uh, specific by just talking about NP hardness first. 
right? NP hardness, um, basically we work with the hypothesis that P is not equal to NP. Or in other words, that satisfiability is not in polynomial time. And then we use classic NP hardness reductions to prove super polynomial lower bounds if you want, right? We show that problems are NP hard, meaning that unless P is equal NP, they do not have polynomial, uh, polynomial time algorithms, meaning we get super polynomial lower bounds. Uh, and in particular, this of course has been done for the subset sum problem. A subset sum is, uh, was one of the original 10 problems that have been shown to be NP hard. So from, from the 70s, we know that unless P is equal NP, subset sum does not have a algorithms running in time polynomial in N and log T, meaning the dependence on T cannot be improved to poly log T. All right, now around 2000, um, more quantitative hypotheses um, uh, uh, were uh, formulated, the exponential time hypothesis and then the strong exponential time hypothesis. Um, so what do we get from these stronger hypotheses? The exponential time hypothesis postulates that satisfiability really requires exponential time, meaning you cannot solve it in time two to a little o of n, where n is the number of variables. If you use this, and um, the, the machinery belonging to it. So for example, you also need the, uh, the, the sparsification lemma by Impagliazzi and Paturi typically. And then if you use this hypothesis and combine it with NP hardness reductions, then you can prove conditional lower bounds that are tied up to the constant in the exponent. So we don't know what is the right constant in the exponent because the hypothesis that we start from doesn't postulate what is the right uh, exponent, the right constant in the exponent. But up to that constant, we can show tight lower bounds for many problems. In particular, this has been done for the subset sum problem, uh, independently by Burman et al. and, and Janssen et al. We showed that, um, uh, that um, subset sum does not have an algorithm in time t to the little of one times two to the little of n. So either you need um, polynomial time in t or you need exponential time in n. Uh, to solve the subset sum problem, assuming the exponential time happens. Okay, so this rules out um, many possible dependencies on t. Does not yet rule out, for example, a square root t time algorithm. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next, next stronger hypothesis that people have uh, formulated, which is the strong exponential time hypothesis, SETH. And this one essentially for, postulates that satisfiability really takes two to the n time. So it cannot be solved in time 1.999 to the n time. More precisely, it actually states the following, that whatever, uh, whatever constant epsilon you pick, there exists a constant k, such that the k sub problem cannot be solved in two to the one minus epsilon n time. Okay, it doesn't matter so much here uh, uh, why this is formulated exactly in this way, but this is, this is nice. This is the hypothesis. Now, if you use this, combine it with the standard tool specification lemma, and then combine it with NP hardness reductions. In principle, you can prove lower bounds that are, that, that are correct with the correct constant in the exponent. And we actually did this for the subset sum problem, in, at least with respect to pseudopolynomial time. What we showed uh, two years ago is that um, subset sum cannot be solved in time t to the one minus epsilon times two to the little of n uh, for any positive constant epsilon. So, right, so what does it mean? It means that um, uh, if you want to have sublinear dependence on t, then you need to pay an exponential factor in a. So of course you can run, um, uh, can run Bellman's algorithm that takes time linear time in t. Um, Okay, if you want better than linear dependence on T, then you actually need exponential dependence on N, like for example, the meet in the middle approach. Um, so because this is, uh, uh, okay, let me actually write that, write out what exactly we proved here, because um, I mean, there are two variables here, T and N, and it's always not so easy. What does it mean uh, to have a, a lower bound with respect to two parameters? So more precisely, we show the following here, namely that any positive constant epsilon, there exists a positive constant delta, such that subset sum cannot be solved in sublinear time in t, t to the one minus epsilon, uh, on instances with uh, delta times log t many items. 
Okay. Um, so in order to show such a result, we need a reduction from satisfiability to subset sum. And we need this to be to satisfy the following. First of all, we need the um, the bit length of the numbers, the logarithm of the target, it's the bit length of the numbers. This needs to be roughly one plus epsilon n, or at most one plus epsilon times the number of variables. Because then if you take t to the one minus epsilon, you get something faster than two to the n. And we need the number of items to be order n to satisfy the second constraint, the number of items is delta dot t. So it's a, it's, in principle, it's again a kind of an NP hardness reduction, apart from the specification lemma, from satisfiability to subset sum. Uh, one has to, uh, yeah, so one has to watch out uh, a lot and uh, be, be very tight with the construction to, to use a bit length that is really just linear in n and actually just one plus epsilon times n. Um, um, yeah, um, I mean, um, I'm not going to say more about this, but um, um, right, but it, this answers this question that we started from here, right? We started from Bellman's n times d algorithm. We asked whether the dependence on t can be improved. Now we came to the conclusion that this is unlikely that it can be improved because any improvement to sublinear dependence on T would, would uh, falsify the strong exponential time hypothesis, which, well, is the standard hypothesis in, in fine-grained complexity. So if you falsify this, then this would be a big breakthrough. So it's kind of unlikely. Um, right, so the dependence on T cannot be improved. Then what about the dependence on N? In, so let's say we want linear dependence on t, or maybe just near linear dependence on t. Can we shave off this factor n? It's the next question we can think about. And indeed, this actually this actually works. This kind of improvement is possible. It was first shown by Kiliaras and Xu, who improved this uh, Bellman algorithm or improved the running time of Bellman's algorithm to square root n times t. And then I later improved this to near linear time and t. So that's t times a couple of log factors in n and t. Um, the big difference here is that these previous approaches are deterministic and uh, my algorithm is randomized. And then later Jin and Wu, they further improved the log factors to, actually, to just have running time t log t. And this is also randomized. So it's an, it's an open problem whether this can be de-randomized. All right, that's the state of the art um, of subset sum with respect to parameters n and t. So if you express the running time in terms of the number of items at the target number. And, um, and from this perspective, we now have a conditionally optimal algorithm for subsets, right? We can solve it in a near linear time in t. You cannot get sublinear dependence on t unless you want exponential time in n. So, um, so for a wide range of possible target values, this, this gives a, a, a conditionally optimal algorithm. And um, right, this is conditional on this SCTH assumption. It's also up to lower order fa factors, right? It would still be that we can shave off mo more log factors from this running time. Cannot rule this out. Um, but up to this, it's a conditionally optimal algorithm. Um, Right, and um, I want to tell you about this algorithm, how it, uh, more or less how it works. All right, um, good. Now, the, the kind of algorithms that I'm talking about today are convolution-based algorithms, meaning at some point in the algorithm, you, you solve a convolution problem. What's a convolution problem? It's some problem from the following family of problems. You fix two operations, let me just call them plus and times. And for every any two such operations, you get one problem, plus times convolution. And in this problem, you're given two arrays A and B of length n. You want to compute a third array C of length n. Um, and the way that you or the, the way this third array is defined is that uh, the kth entry of C. Uh, you obtain by summing over all pairs of indices i and j such that i plus j is equal to k. Right? So this big sum here goes over uh, about k possible values, about k possible pairs i and j, uh, namely all pairs i and j that sum to k. 
And for each such pair, you multiply AI with BJ, and you sum this up, and you get the kth entry of Z. OK, so um, naively, you can compute this, this uh, output array in n squared operations, right? Uh, there are k possible, I mean, there are k entries that you want to compute. For each entry, there are about n possible pairs, i and j, that you look at. So using n squared of these operations, one can compute the convolution naively. And typically, we assume that these operations run in constant time, so this would also be n squared time. OK, so the convolution is just um, a family of problems that can be solved in n squared time. Some of these problems can be solved much faster. So standard convolution, for example, is the one that you get when this first operation is standard addition and the second operation is standard multiplication of numbers. Um, right? That's the plus times convolution. It's the standard convolution problem. And it's equivalent to polynomial multiplication. If you think about it, this array A describes the, uh, the, the coefficients of a polynomial. And similarly, the array B describes the coefficients of a polynomial. And you compute this plus times convolution, then the array C will describe the coefficients of their product. Right? Because if, you, if you're looking at uh, uh, the coefficient of x to the k, well, then you can combine the coefficient of x to the i and x to the j whenever i plus j is equal to k. This really is convolution describes the operation of giving the sequences of coefficients of two, uh, of two polynomials how to derive the product. And we all know that polynomial multiplication is actually an n log n time by using fast Fourier transforms. So this is actually a problem that can be solved faster than n squared. Another faster problem is the, the Boolean convolution, so where these operations are or and end. Um, and really, the Boolean convolution um, it more or less corresponds to the uh, the support of standard convolution. If you compute the standard convolution of two vectors. Uh, and then uh, look at which um, which coefficients are non-negative, uh, non-zero, and you get the Boolean convolution. So by a reduction to the standard convolution, this can also be solved in n log n. Okay, and similarly, um, so the standard convolution is equivalent to polynomial multiplication. Boolean convolution is also equivalent to an interesting problem, namely some set computation. So suppose that you're given two sets of integers and they range from 1 to n. And you want to compute uh, their sum set, which is this set here. Uh, you look at all pairwise sums of an element of a plus an element of b. And you just look at the set of all these sums. So you, you remove duplicates. Uh, if you want to compute the sum set, then um, well, this, is the, this is the same as Boolean convolution. Basically, the um, uh, if you compute the Boolean convolution of the indicator vectors of A and B, then you get the indicator vector of the sum set. Anyways. OK, so and I said that um, um, the, the type of algorithms that I'm talking about, they are convolution-based. And uh, they all follow this uh, partition and convolution approach, where first we partition our problem into subproblems, typically two, sometimes more, typically a random split, sometimes not. Um, so some partition into subproblems, you recursively solve the subproblems, and then you combine the solutions of the subproblems using the appropriate form of convolution. At the beginning, this will just be some set computation, meaning Boolean convolution. Later, there will be other types of convolution. Um, OK, anyways, um, if you don't know much about convolutions, uh, you, you, I mean, we, I'm not using anything about this. Uh, so in the following, I, I want to show you this subset sum algorithm. And all I'm really using is this here. Uh, can, you can forget about convolutions for now if you want. But all I'm using is this, this notation. So first of all, a superset uh, a superscript 0 is just the same set where you add 0. Uh, and that's an operation that makes sense for subset sum because uh, you're always allowed to pick an empty set. So you pick the subset sum 0. And then the sum set is some, um, well, as I said before, you take all pairwise sums of an element of A and an element of B. That also makes sense for subset sum, right? Because this generates all the possible subset sums where you pick one element in A and one element in B. And then this t-capped sum set is 
uh, I write this as a plus subscript tb. This is just you take the sum set, but you ignore numbers larger than t. And this also makes sense here because we, in the subset sum problem, we are only interested uh, in whether the target is attainable. So we we never want to look at subsets that sum to more than t. So we we are um, we're only interested in these t cap sums. And we know now that this can be computed in t log t time because it's basically Boolean convolution, which well can be reduced to standard convolution. Um, right. So how does this help? How can we make use of this t cap sum set operation? If we're given a subset sum instance x, then well we shouldn't look at x plus itself, sum set of x with itself. That's um that's an operation that doesn't really make sense for subset sum because it contains sums of the form x plus itself, right? You can choose the same number x on the left and on the right summand. And that gives you a, a sum that does not correspond to a subset. Uh, but what we can do is to partition the input set x. So let's partition x into x1 and x2, compute the sum set of x1 and x2. And this only contains valid subset sums of x, right? Um, because you cannot choose the same element twice because well, left and right hand side are disjoint. Okay, so this is what we want to make use of now. And uh, our goal will be to compute all valid subset sums, meaning uh, we go for all possible subsets of x. We want uh, sigma of y is just a shorthand notation for the sum of all elements at y. Um, but we're only interested in the sums below t. This is the set that we want to compute. Okay, so after all this setup, um, here starts the algorithm. Okay, so we, um, I want to show you a uh, near linear and t algorithm to solve the subset sum problem now. And that will proceed in two steps. First step will be later used as a subroutine. And this first step is to detect the sums of small subsets. Okay, so look at a, look at a subset of the input set x. It sums to at most t, sums to at most the target, and it has cardinality at most k, meaning it is it's a small subset, a small cardin cardinality. Um, what do we do to detect all these sums of small subsets? We randomly partition the input set into k squared many parts. Okay, so for every input number, pick a random number between one and k squared, and you put that input number into the corresponding bin. Okay, just a random partition of the input set. And then we compute the following sum set. Right, so what is this? Um, so for each bucket xi, first we add zero to that bucket, and then we compute the t capped sum set of all these buckets, right? So first compute this t capped sum set, then the next and so on. It doesn't matter which ordering. Um, Right, that's, that's uh, basically the algorithm for this. Um, so what happens here? Um, what does this algorithm do? So to fix some, some small subsets, fix some set y with uh, k elements, or let's say at most k elements, uh, what, does this, what does this algorithm do to it? Well, the random partitioning somehow splits the set, right? Every element of y goes to a random bucket. And it can happen, of course, that two elements of y land in the same bucket. And that will be the bad event for us. That's where the case where y is not split. That's the bad event. OK, so let's look at the good event then. The good event is that the set y that we are currently looking at, that this is split, meaning that every bucket contains at most one element of y. OK, so maybe y3 is the only element of y landing in x1 and so on. Okay, if that is the case, if y is split, then I clean, then let's look at the following sum in this in this sum set here. What do I do? So if if a bucket contains an element of y, then I pick that element in my sum. If a bucket does not contain any element of y, then I just pick zero. And remember that I added zero, so I'm always allowed to, to, to pick zero. Okay, if I do this for all the buckets, well, every bucket contains at most one element of y. It means that um, uh, in total, every element of y I see exactly once. So this whole sum here is just the sum of all elements in y. 
Okay, so what I've what I've shown you is that if y is split, if we are in a good event, then this the sum of y will be in the output set, will be in the sum set that we compute. Um, right. So, um, right. Um, so the only thing that remains to do here is to bound the probability that we are in the good event. Now what is the probability that if you throw k bins into k squared balls, that uh, that all the balls are isolated? Um, that's basically the birthday paradox. It's actually even the easy side of the birthday paradox. And this, uh, and I, I can easily show that this has at least constant probability, something like one over e. Okay, so with constant probability, this, this small set is split, and then we find its sum. Now we boost the success probability, success probability by repeating this log n times. So our subroutine for detecting small sub, subset sums is now as follows. Repeat log n times. Every round, you split into k squared. Uh, you pick a random partitioning into k squared parts. And you co compute the sum set, as on the last slide. In the end, you just return the union over all of those. And then uh, what we get from this is that, first of all, every returned number actually corresponds to a subset sum. And, and then the, the, so the important correctness guarantee is that um, for every small subset, um, with that most k elements, uh, its sum is contained in the output with high probability. Right? We've seen on the last slide this holds with constant probability. And then now we repeat this for log n. What's the running time of the algorithm? Well, we do something for log n times. And the, the, uh, the bottleneck here is to do k squared many sum set computations. Each sum set computation we have seen is in t log t time. Up to log factors, this is just t times k squared, now in term that we get. Now, later we will set k to be polylog, so this whole thing will just be near linear in t. OK, so polylog size subsets we can detect in near linear time. That's what we have shown. Uh, and this follows this partition and convolution approach that I, that I described to you, that we first pick a random partitioning, and then we convolve the results. And here, convolution just means to compute the sums. All right, that was the first step to handle small sums, small subsets, sorry. And now the second step is recursion, and it's actually um, quite sim similar to the first step. OK, so if, consider some instance again, x, t, and, and fix some subset summing to at most t. Um, now, the first thing that we do is we split the items into large and small ones. And here, large means something like t over polylocking. Now, the large items are easy to handle, right? Um, large items are larger than t over polylog n. So any solution summing to at most t can pick at most polylog n large items. So if we run the algorithm from the last slide, where this size bound k is polylog n, then we find just all the subset sums of um, uh, of the large items. In particular, we will find this the sum of our fixed set y restricted to the large items. Uh, we will find this with high probability. OK, so we handled the large items. Um, now the small items, what do we do with the small items? Well, we do the same trick. We randomly partition, but now into two parts. Uh, why does it help to randomly partition into two parts? Uh, well, so in the so, um, you look at what this random partitioning is doing to the small items in my fixed solution y. Well, these these are also split into uh, into some subsets, right? Um, so, and in expectation, about half of the elements in in y will land in the left or on the right subproblem. And also an expectation, the the sum of this, uh, so the sum uh, of y i will be about t half, uh, at most t half. Uh, that holds an expectation. It's easy to see, um, but um, right. Uh, what we what we can show is that it also holds with high probability. Uh, why is that? So um, right. So. Uh, Okay, so either ys already sums to at most t half, then we're done. It sums to something more. 
It means that Y consists of many small items. And if you have many small items that you randomly partition, that's a situation where one can use standard concentration inequalities to show that uh, also the sum of the subsets is concentrated. And in particular, the kind of concentration that we get here is that, um, uh, well, we, we, uh, that in the subproblem, we only need to look at uh, subsets summing to at most one plus epsilon times t half, where epsilon is something like one over polylog n. Okay. Um, so we reduced the problem to two subproblems where roughly the target number decreased by a factor two. And we, then we would just recursively solve these two subproblems. And then the end, and this recursively gives us some subsets, some sets of subset sums, S1 and S2. At the end, we just, um, again, do the, the convolution to combine these solutions together. So we compute t-capped subset, t-capped sum set, S1, S2, and SL. So this is what these two recursive subproblems gave us and what the, the large items gave us. And then, um, yeah, I can show that uh, with high probability, we actually find the sum of y in this algorithm. Uh, what's the running time here? Let me roughly argue about the running time. Um, so what, what do we do here? So the, I mean, uh, OK, so this color coding thing runs in nearly near time in t. That's what we've seen on the last slide. Um, we plug in the size bound k being polylog n, so we get near linear time t. Uh, these sum sets here also run in near linear time in t. So, so the, this additive linear time in t, OK, well, that's done. And then we get two subproblems where roughly the number of items is halved and roughly the target bound is halved. Um, now, this roughly is just a small factor, one plus one over log n. So over a depth of log n, this factor doesn't hurt. So roughly speaking, this is uh, this is uh, a recursion that we know, right? Roughly speaking, it's a recursion where you get two subproblems of half the size, which just add, which just adds another log factor on top of the running time that we already have. So in total, we still get running time near linear time t. Anyways. Um, that was the rough overview over this algorithm. And again, it's this partition and convolution style algorithm, right? Uh, we, um, I mean, we do something special to the large items, but then the small items, we randomly partition into two parts. Uh, and then in the end, we combine the results by computing a sum set, which is some type of convolution. OK, now I've given you pretty much all the details of this algorithm here. I mean, it might have been a bit, uh, a bit fast to, to follow all the, uh, all the analysis, but, um, but more or less, you now know how to solve a subset sum in near linear time t. Um, right. Now, I said that subset sum is a special case of many other problems, and that's why it is such an important problem. Um, Right, so naturally, once you get a lower bound for subset sum or a faster algorithm for subset sum, then you should think about how this generalizes to other settings of subset sum and to other problems um, that generalize subset sum. Um, now, if you look at the lower bound that we've proven, of course, this directly transfers to all the generalized, to all generalizations, right? Any more general problem like NAPSEC, uh, the same kind of lower bound holds. It's not necessarily a tight lower bound anymore, but at least it directly transfers. The kind of algorithm that we've shown with this partition and convolution, this, this doesn't directly generalize, right? Uh, if you look at the more general problem, maybe this kind of algorithm doesn't work anymore. So really, for every generalization, we have to think about whether this kind of approach can still work or not. And then more generally, of course, we have seen this conditionally optimal algorithm for subset sum with parameter t. Can we also get this for generalization? Um, OK, and this um, we can ask for many different settings now, of course. Um, uh, I mean, there's the, the NAPSEC problem is the one that first comes to mind, of course. And there are approximation algorithms for subset sum and NAPSEC and other problems studied output sensitive al uh, algorithms for this. You can look at other parameters than t. Uh, and then you can look at more general classes of, of problems, like scheduling problems, integer linear programming, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, in many of these settings, actually, this uh, partition and convolution approach does give something. That's why I wanted to present it today. Um, right. Let me actually start by talking a bit about this knapsack problem because it's uh, it's quite it's an illustrating problem, and it's natural, of course, to, uh, once you have a subset sum algorithm, to think about whether it generalizes to to knapsack. So this here is the knapsack problem, right? Um, have n items again. Now every item has a weight and profit, and we have a weight budget w. Now let me introduce this bit of notation here, and it's uh, f x of y. That's the optimal profit that you can get for any subset of weight at most i. Okay, so this function f x somehow encodes all the optimal optimal values of knapsack. So uh, if you plug in any weight budget into this function, you get the optimal profit. We're actually only interested in computing one number here, right? We're, what we actually just want to compute is this fx of the weight budget. Anyways, that's the knapsack problem. Um, the same Bellman algorithm works for this. Okay, so you can solve it in n times w time. Actually, with a little bit of pre-processing, you can also get an n plus w squared running time if you want. Um, and uh, it directly generalizes the subset sum problem. So the, the lower bound that we had for subset sum uh, immediately applies here. It tells us that there cannot be a running time, that there cannot be an algorithm for knapsack with sublinear dependence on the weight budget and sub-exponential dependence on the number of items. Okay, so we need at least linear dependence on W. Um, but of course, we can again ask whether we can shave off this vector N, and that is not so clear. Um, so specifically, we could ask whether this partition and convolution approach still still works, still applicable, and whether it yields the same kind of running time as for subset sum, which would be n plus w. So let's try this partition and convolution approach. Um, let's uh, take an AppSec instance, somehow split it into two subproblems, so meaning split the set of items, partition a set of items into two parts. Uh, let's say we recursively compute this function, uh, this knapsack function fx. So we compute fx1 and fx2. We compute all possible optimal profits for the left subproblem and the right subproblem. Right? That's one way of um, raising a recursive algorithm for NAPSEC. If you do this, then you, want, then you want to do the following combination step, I claim. Um, so how do we get uh, fx? fx of k now. So the, how do we combine these these uh, knapsack functions together? Well, um, if you have a budget of k for the whole set x, then you need to somehow split this into a budget for the left subproblem and the budget of the right subproblem. So you want to um, split k into i plus j, and then allocate budget i, i to x1 and allocate budget j to x2, which gives this total profit here. And if you maximize over all possibilities this way, then, then, you, get, uh, then you get the optimal profit for NAPS. OK, this is, the, um, right. this is what uh, you would naturally go to. Um, and it leads us to, I mean, another convolution problem here, right? It's a convolution problem where we have a max here and a plus here. OK, so if we go back to the kind of this family of convolution problems that we looked at, and now we have the max plus convolution problem, auto operations plus and the inner, uh, auto operations max and the inner plus. Um, now you might, I mean, you might more. Uh, uh, so this is equivalent to min plus convolution just by negating all, all entries. And this is actually the problem that is, that, uh, I mean, that's the more standard problem to talk about, min plus convolution. It's equivalent. Now, this turns out to be one of the hard convolution problems. So, of course, naively, you can solve it in n squared time, but the best known running time just shaves off a little lower order factor. And there's no strongly subcritic time algorithm known. And actually, this is formalized as a hypothesis in fine grained complexity that there is no n to the 2 minus delta algorithm for this book. Um, right. So, uh, if we do this partition and convolution approach for the knapsack problem, then we naturally get min plus convolution, which is a hard problem, and which results in a, in a bad running time. Just what you, what you get back is just this n plus w squared running time. 
So again, something that is quadratic and not linear and, and plus double. Um, right, so it seems that this approach fails and it doesn't give anything for NAPSEC, um, which is not quite true, which looks like it in, on, at first sight, but it's not quite true. Um, First of all, what it, one thing that it gives is that you can transfer the lower order improvements from a plus convolution to an EPSEC. So you get this kind of improvement, weird looking improvement. Um, what it also gives is a reduction from NAPSEC to min plus convolution. And actually other people have, uh, have shown that you can, that there is uh, also a reduction in the other way around. So it turns out that, um, I mean, uh, this partition and convolution approach naturally led us to min plus convolution. And it turns out that NAPSEC and min plus convolution are actually equivalent. So it's inherent that you look at min plus convolution. And what one can show is that if you get this kind of subquadratic running time for NAPSEC, so subquadratic in N plus W, and then you would also get subquadratic time for min plus convolution. And this is equivalent. Actually. So, um, so we united two questions about the complexity of problems here now. Um, right. So instead of studying these kind of algorithms for an EPSEC, we only need to study min plus convolution in, in the future. Good. Um, so so um, partition and convolution is applicable. It doesn't really give you give us what we expected, but it gives something. Um, um, Right, and there are many other um, directions to go into. One is some um, approximation algorithms for subset sum. Uh, so this here was the formulation of it. So if, if we want to talk about approximation, we first need to look at an optimization version of subset sum, right? Standard optimization version is this year. You compute the maximum sum of the subset of a subset summing to at most t. And once we have this optimization version, we can look at uh, approximation schemes. So for example, um, so the standard uh, notion of a, an approximation scheme for subset sum asks for a subset uh, that sums to somewhere between one minus epsilon opt and opt. All right, and this has been long studied since the 70s. People came up with faster and faster approximation schemes. For example, you can solve it and it, yeah, the two best known uh, um, running times are n over epsilon and n plus one over epsilon squared. Um, Okay, that's, so that's the state of the art of approximation schemes for subset sum. Um, again, this is uh, um, it's uh, it's related to pseudo polynomial time algorithms for subset sum, namely because if you plug in an epsilon that is less than one over t, less than one over the target, then you solve subset sum exactly. So, for example, this 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 little observation it turns the n over epsilon approximation scheme into the n times t Bellman running time, right? So, um, uh, so approximation schemes are a more general setting of subset sum. In particular, we immediately can transfer the lower bound that we had, uh, which gives us that uh, you cannot have a sublinear dependence on one of epsilon unless you pay an exponential factor in n. Okay, so the lower bound immediately transfers. Of course, the algorithm does not immediately transfer. And again, we have to think about whether this partition and convolution approach can be applied to approximation schemes. And maybe it can give an analogous running time of n plus one over epsilon. Okay, the bad news is that uh, it can't. Um, so again, using this kind of the same kind of approach, uh, thinking about what is the right kind of convolution that uh, in this approximation setting, uh, you, this will, I mean, uh, this leads to again min plus convolution, and one can actually again show that uh, approximating subset sum is equivalent to min plus convolution, in the sense that, um, right, in, in the following sense, namely that if you look at a one minus one over n approximation, if you set epsilon to one over n, and uh, that's a setting where all the previous algorithms run in n square time, and if you would improve this to subquadratic time, you would also improve min plus convolution to subquadratic time uh, and vice versa. So again, we're unifying two problems here and, um, and uh, uh, yeah, nicely get a, a, 
uh, maybe the final answer uh, for approximation schemes for subset sum. Who knows? Um, right. Now, um, if you look at the approximation schemes, uh, if you express the runtime of these approximation schemes in the form n plus 1 over epsilon 2 to c, some constant c, then what we've seen is that for subset sum, this exponent is 2, right? I mean, you can solve it in n over epsilon or n plus 1 over epsilon squared, meaning in terms of, if you want to express this in terms of n plus 1 over epsilon to the c, then, it's, it's, then this exponent c is 2. And we've also seen a lower bound because um, when epsilon is 1 over n, you need quadratic time. So this optimal exponent is 2 for subset sum. You can look at this for a similar, so for, for other optimization problems. For, so for um, the partition problem, which is just the special case of subset sum where the target is half of the total input sum. Actually, with respect to most settings, subset sum and partition are equivalent. Turns out that with respect to approximation schemes, the partition problem is much easier than subset sum. Mura there, they were the first to show that, the, the, that one can actually get exponent less than one. Current, and we, we improved this exponent to three over two. Currently, uh, the best bounds for the best exponent lie, I mean, this best known best exponent has to lie between one and three half. Uh, and we don't know yet where exactly that lies there. So that's one of the open problems here. Similarly, for knapsack, uh, this optimal exponent must lie between 2 and n over 4. Uh, I strongly believe that it should be 2, but, um, but uh, yeah, can't show this. Another nice open problem. OK, um, I should uh, get to an end here. Um, uh, uh, Any way of. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there are many other directions here, like output sensitive algorithms, other parameters. Um, for example, if you look at the, the largest input number as a parameter, then we don't know yet what is the best known running time. We don't know whether uh, one can get linear dependence on the largest input. It's one of the nice open problems. Uh, of course, you can also generalize the same to uh, scheduling problems and so on. Um, but let me just uh, stop with, again with this big overview here. Um, right. Um, uh, ask questions and yeah, stop. Okay, thanks, Carl. Let me give a virtual clap. Uh, we have time for a lot of questions. There are a few questions. I can also continue and talk about other of these topics here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could go on for five more minutes. So. Or sure. There are questions. So maybe let me get started. Uh, you know, maybe that will encourage more questions. So you mentioned this subset sum using convolution and partition. So I see that you can detect whether the sum is t, but like if you had to actually want to find you know, so like the search problem, like do you lose something when you go from decision to search? Or? No, um, uh, it's, it's, um, right, so for, for, um, uh, so if you only want to know the solution summing to T, then it actually pretty much immediately follows from this here that you can reconstruct it because, um, I mean, you, you trace back this, this, this recursion tree, right? So uh, if you know that there is, a, there is something summing to T, um, I mean, just try out, uh, I mean, in a sum set, you can do it, right? You know that there is a sum A plus B summing to C, and just try out all possible A's and check whether C minus A is in B. So in linear time, you can trace back whether there and find a solution inside the sum set. Um, uh, right, and in this way you can trace back the algorithm to to uh, right. Actually, that even holds more generally that even for Boolean convolution, you can find witnesses uh, at least by a randomized algorithm. Um, so even for all the outputs, you can you can find uh, you can find a witness if you want. Okay, without much overhead, because like in convolution, it's not immediately obvious. 
Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, with, with some lock factors overhead, you can find witnesses for Boolean convolution. Okay. Okay, so let me ask maybe one more, which uh, I found very interesting. So you mentioned this separation between subset sum and partition for, and usually I always think of them as the same problems, but you said for these approximation, that is like one and two versus like one and three. So is there some intuition why or like? It's quite surprising. Um, for, for partition, you get resource augmentation for free. That's the intuition. So if you want to sum to a, if you want to subset summing to somewhere between t half and one minus epsilon times t half, um, then I mean you can relax the problem. You only want to find a subset summing to somewhere between one plus epsilon times t half and one minus epsilon times t half, and I slightly extend the, the upper end. Because if you find something between one plus and one minus epsilon times t half, then either the subset itself or its complement also sums to at most t half. So automatically, once you have a solution for the relaxed problem, you also get one for the stricter problem. Um, right. So you can round uh, the numbers to uh, right. Okay. So you can re relax this upper bound by a factor one plus epsilon, which is I mean some sort of re resource augmentation. And this you get for free for partition. You don't get it in general for subsets. Actually, uh, if you do allow this form of resource augmentation for subset sum, then you can also get a subcritic algorithm. What uh, what Mukha tells you. Okay. And for partition, you get it for free. I see. Cool. Okay, I see a question in the. Uh, let me ask. So Andras Salomon asks, um, is there any hope that the hypothesis could be weakened obtaining fine-grained hardness conditional on ETH rather than SETH? Yes, so if you want the right exponent in the uh, of the running time, so really you want that t to the one is the right running time, not just t to the little of one, and then Basically, there is no hope to get an SDTH-based lower bound. Uh, I mean, for some very special problems, one can also show these kinds of lower bounds, but it's, uh, those are like some very specialized problems. Uh, in general, if you want to show lower bounds with the right exponent and the, the right constant in the exponent, you need to use SDTH, not just ETH. Um, right, and I mean, we showed these matching lower bounds for the pseudo polynomial setting. It's uh, it's so uh, it's wide open whether uh, one can match meet in the middle by such a tight lower bound. So whether one can show that two to the n over two is the is the right exponential running time, or whether one can get two minus epsilon to the n over two. That's open. I see. So there is nothing like two to the n over three known for subset sum, like using SCTH. No, yeah. no, no. no. Uh, you cannot get two to the little of n, but this little of n is an, it's not an explicit constant. So yeah, let's thank all again for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Paul.